Um, Jerome talked about ILDA a little bit earlier today, and uh, this is going to, I'm going to talk about ILDA, but from a slightly different angle. Uh, today I'm going to primarily talk about ILDA and how it specifically forms uh, the Miamia language uh, efforts that we do. So, but I'm actually glad that he introduced ILDA because it gives you a little more background than I would have time to do. And um, before I get started, I would like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Mellon Foundation for the funding that made the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive possible. Mishinewe. We are in the extremely fortunate position with Miamia language in that we are blessed with a truly exceptional amount of data spanning something like 230 years. In the early 1700s, three major French missionary dictionaries survive. From the 1800s through the early 1900s, there are four major language sources and another half dozen minor ones. Together, these manuscripts add up to thousands of pages of data and tens of thousands of words. For a long time, a major challenge uh, in learning, reconstructing, and teaching Miamia was how to pull all this data together in one place. Many of the best sources on Miami, Illinois are actually quite disorganized with most of the data in nothing like alphabetical order, making it hard to look anything up. There was a strong need for a single database where all the known Miamia data could be roped together in one place so that searches could be made, uh, easily be made spanning all the known sources of the language. There have been a few dictionary programs on the market for several years, but they are specifically designed for people doing field work and were a very poor fit for what we needed. As a result of this, the 20, in 2012, the Miamia Center decided to create its own database geared, customized to our needs of teachers and learners. And the result is the Indigenous Languages Digital Archive, or ILDA for short. Originally it was called MIDA, but it's now ILDA. ILDA has been in use for several years now, and it has transformed our ability to find data in the Miami language sources. As it is conceived of now, ILDA will eventually hold everything from all the sources, anything on the, on the Miami language or Peoria language. Over the past several years, we have managed to upload uh, all of several language sources and have begun to upload several others. So for the manuscripts here that have been completely entered into ILDA, we uh, began the project thinking it would take three years, and it actually took about one, uh, uploading all of Boulanger's 1725 French Illinois Dictionary, which came, co presently comes to uh, 26,000 entries. Next, we uploaded all of Largillier's Illinois French Dictionary from 1690, uh, which comes to over 31,000 additional entries. We did all of Trowbridge's Miami Field Notes from the um, Detroit Public Library from 1824 to 1825, over 2,000 entries. And all of Michelson's 1960 Peoria field notes with um, 1,388 entries. And we're still midway through several other uploads. We are about a third of the way through uploading Panette's Illinois Dictionary, and I'll show you shortly what these look like. With about 7,955 entries so far, almost all of Gatchett's original um, field notebooks on Miami and Peoria from the 1890s, and also remaining to be uploaded, um, is the rest of Panette, the remaining two-thirds, the rest of Gatchett's materials, and everything Jacob Dunn got. None of Jacob Dunn's materials have been uploaded yet, but that's coming later this year. So how much data is now in the ILDA database, um, Miamia data? All told, at this moment, ILDA has 78,428 entries total. There's a nice counter function in ILDA that tells you exactly how many forms there are in there. Uh, this time two years ago, when I was making notes for the talk I thought I was going to give in April of 2020, I saw that back then we had 59,000 entries at the time, so that tells you how much we were able to upload during COVID. And um, new data will, I suspect, probably will be still uploading new data for another eight or ten years. And all of this data, I should emphasize this, is now searchable uh, all on a level field with each other for the very first time ever. Um, people, it's, I've always thought it's nice to sort of give people a perspective as to what these manuscripts I talk about actually look like, and there's not enough time to go into this, but this gives you a tiny little sampling of this. Um, this is one of the most famous sources from the Jesuit period. This is about a 500-plus page Illinois to French dictionary. It's what we refer to as Largillier from about the 1690s, but we're not sure. 
It's been entirely entered. As I said, it was the second thing we uploaded, and it has 30, it counts for 31,000 of the entries we have at the moment. And this is a completely typical looking page chosen at random of what we had to key onto the computer and upload. And this is um, the Le Bourget Dictionary. This currently lives at John Carter Brown Library in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, it counts for 26,000 of the entries, and this dates to something somewhere around 1720, 1725. Um, this is Charles Trowbridge's field notes on Indiana, Miami, which are interesting because um, they were collected in northern Indiana someplace in, 18, in the winter of 1824 to 1825. And previously, this was a very hard document to use because it existed in a terrible quality microfilm from the early 70s that I found so illegible I didn't even bother with it. And um, Jonathan and I went and filmed it in Detroit just ourselves. I mean, they gave us their blessing to do so when we simply went there and banged through it one page at a time. And so now, uh, high quality images of it exist for the first time, and it's amazing that I never had access to it. When we finally had a legible copy, I was thrilled because there's things in this that I was unaware of because the previous copy was so hard to use, and now it's all keyed in and all searchable. It's uh, about 2,000 entries. And this is a typical example of what Albert Gatchett's field notes from the 1890s from Oklahoma look like. Uh, this, uh, he, so far, he got a lot more data than this, but so far we have about 9,000 entries, and we're almost done entering this whole manuscript. And this is a, a story here. Um, I think this is one of the Wisaka Chakwa stories. This is right here. But this is a typical example of what his scribbly notes look like. Almost all his work was in Oklahoma. And this is an example of the manuscript that we're about a third of the way th wading through right now. This is the Panette Dictionary, which some of you know was only f discovered in 1999. Um, the one I, when I went and looked at in Montreal a couple years back. And, it's about one third entered. Um, it come uh, the about eight thousand entries entered, and this is what one of the nicer pages looks like. This is what one of the more manageable pages look like. This one's um, very small and hard to read, but just to give you some perspective, this is what one of the worst pages looks like. Um, some of the pages are. This is a, a manuscript that's so difficult. At first, we were not really entirely sure we were going to even do it, and. We didn't want to punish our transcriptionists and transcriptionists and, and translator with this, but with, well, we finished the other two in much less time than we thought, and it's like, well, you're still here. So there's other pages that look even worse than this, but this is what I found in a quick search as a fairly typical bad page. So this is why this, this we left this one for last, and it's probably going I suspect it's going to take another three to four years to finish keying in. Um, anyway. I also wanted to talk about the actual process. Um, how much time do I got? Oh, okay. I wanted to talk about the process from which how does data from these actual paper or parchment manuscripts make the migration to being in a database. And basically, I mean, I could go into a lot more detail than this, but the original uh, images of the manuscripts are page and line numbered by Carol Katz. Um, which means basically she keys in the manuscript and either Carol or someone she assigns the task to numbers the lines and the pages. Um, the content of the pages is uh, keyed in, and like I said, that's done by Carol alone. Uh, if the translations of the Miami words are in French, then the English translations of, French, of the French are added by Michael McCafferty, because not a lot of us read French, and especially not this weird 300-year-old French, so that makes the missionary stuff much easier to use. And then each entry is keyed to a high quality JPEG image of its page, right? So in other words, whenever you look up any word, there's a function where you can click on this button and it shows you with the, uh, a very high quality JPEG of the image so you can see it in context um, in case it's not certain how to read it because this is not all clearly handwritten at all. You can say, well, does it really say that? And it actually, and it almost always really does say what Carol enters it as saying. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes I'm thinking, I, I look at it and I, I can't interpret this, I really hope Carol got it wrong, and I look at it it's like, no, unfortunately, that's exactly what the manuscript says, and I can't say, oh, okay, it's really this. But, um, and this is a typical spreadsheet of what the, the, what the spreadsheets look like when Carol and Michael are done with it. And you see, see the rightmost column, um, everything, except the rightmost column is what Carol enters, and the rightmost column is Michael's translations. 
Um, Michael's very, very good at a kind of weird, archaic American French from the, the, the 1690s. And so um, that's what that's where this manuscript now stands. Is he's about a third of the way sl through slogging through the translations, but the, vis the legibility of the manuscript is what makes is what's making it go slower. And so this is the result when the data from those two people is uploaded to ILDA, and I haven't touched it yet. Um, this is basically an ILDA uh, entry uploaded before any of my analysis, and so you see all the different fields here, and the only fields that are filled the original target language, which means the word that's in the manuscript exactly as spelled. Um, the original gloss, right? In other words, how does the original person who wrote this down translate it? Sometimes that's in French, sometimes it's in English. And Michael, and if it's in French, Michael's translation of the French in English. And that's all that's going to, those are the only fields they fill. This is purely just verbatim as it is from the source. But it's then my job to actually analyze it. And my job is by, of analyzing these data is by far the slowest part of the process. We're uploading data much faster than it can be analyzed. And so, uh, and, and I looked around for a good example of, of an entry that's especially thoroughly filled out. And this is an example sentence from the, I believe the Le Bourget Dictionary that pretty much has a little of everything. It has, it's a full sentence. It has the translation of the sentence. It has what the sentence really means. It has an analysis and breakdown of every single word in the sentence. You know, like you'll look down there in the lower left and the upper right, and every word is broken down and given the individual translations. And there's a few cognates given, like which is the same words in either other Miami sources or other Algonquian languages. And there's even some semantic fields in the lower right hand corner. Like those are the fields where it's like, you know, we've had the thought, we thought to ourselves, what things might people want to look up? Like, you know, okay, they might want to look up tree names or they might want to look up food terms. And so eventually that should become very useful for searches. I think eventually the idea would be, give me a list of all tree names and all those manuscripts and that's what we would bring up. So, so this is what it looks like after I've done full analysis for it. And I should also talk about the use that ILDA gets in the community. Uh, in the sense that our language teachers and learners uh, make a very extensive use of ILDA now, even though it's not, this, this is a different program from the online dictionary, but it's kind of what I call a linguists and a teacher's learning tool. And a very common use for it is queries on how to say things from various tribe members, teachers, and learners. And so, for example, we had a recent request, which you saw earlier today, on how to say welcome. And so we sort of dug around in ILDA for examples, different English words that seem to match that concept. And eventually we were able to find this, which is uh, the set of results for the verb stem mentitohkal, which means something like honor, admire, or welcome, or something like that. And you'll notice that um, certain words appear multiple times in the manuscripts, which is actually kind of good because it means that you get several examples of different takes on what it means or how to spell it or that sort of thing. So this is a very recent example of when we used ILDA to sort of fill a gap in, you know, a word that, an expression we needed to provide. How am I doing on time now? Oh, fine, okay. And um, since I mentioned the online dictionary, I was told not to really go into too much detail on it, but I'll allude to it here because it does relate. The online dictionary is a separate database. I should make that clear. It's a completely separate program, um, which is what we call the student. It's really best viewed as a student's dictionary. Um, MIDA, I'm sorry, ILDA, is a sort of a researcher's dictionary where all the data is just there in raw form, and, and for a while it's not processed yet. The online dictionary is a separate database where, that Jared maintains where we basically tidy up the data and in a much more sort of easy to consume form where you can look words up and you can, like, for example, this is the entry that was just recently created for welcome or honor or admire. And, you know, we have some example sentences. We have some, what we figure will probably be common use inflected verbs and also links to the sound files. Now, the way this relates to ILDA is that I, I, could, I, I won't go into much detail on this, but ILDA and MIDA both draw from the same pool of data. If a form is entered in one of the two databases, it's accessible and visible to the other. So, so the two databases sort of feed each other. 
as I've always said, there was a when we started this project out, we I I was fairly emphatic that we should not try to combine a researcher's dictionary and a student dictionary at the same time, because every time I've seen that attempted, it kind of does a poor job of both. And so we said, let's just keep them separate. Let's just have one for the sort of researchers and nerd use and for the archival use, and another for people who are trying to, you know, just ordinary humans who are trying to learn the language, you know, and who don't have, have never taken linguistic classes. And so that's the reason for the two. And I, I think it was a very smart decision to make. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I knew I, I knew we were, I was saving people a lot of suffering. <laughs> um, and quick um, detour into the linguistic benefits of ILDA. Um, as I said, a huge amount of language data is now searchable for the, and findable for the very first time, especially in the Illinois dictionaries. Uh, this has made it possible to research many topics much more thoroughly than ever before. And uh, I actually use it in my linguistics papers extremely extensively now. It's actually made my linguistics papers look different in terms of what I can, the data I can pull together for them. Um, for example, I did a paper, I have a paper in process now about this word kati, which you, people use all the time, which means will or the future, future marker and so forth. And this is a very hard word to research just by looking at the manuscripts because it doesn't appear, you can't look it up in alphabetical order, right? Because it's just one word and what you want if you're going to study this, is sentences. And so you're hardly going to find, um, before this was searchable, the examples you're going to find were just going to be by accident. But now you can literally just go into ILDA, set, make the search settings correctly, and say, search for all set examples of the whole word examples of the future particle, right? And so suddenly, instead of having about 20 examples of this, I now have a couple hundred. And so as an example, um, there's different ways the particle is spelled, and if you add together all these different spellings, there's, yeah, 426 examples in ILDA now, and there will be more to come with this future particle. And so uh, this is a fairly typical example of a few pages of the search results that come up when you search on the, on the future particle. And so I was basically able to just browse, browse through this and see if any of the examples contradicted my claims, see what examples looked especially easy to understand, and so forth. So one of its biggest benefits was you can find example sentences, which means they're not just little isolated sentences, but it's like grammar and like the language actually working instead of being, you know, this isolated little object. Um, and finally, there is still a lot left to do. Um, several data sources, including one or two big ones, still remain to be uploaded, haven't been uploaded at all. But the main work left is the remaining, my remaining analysis to be done. Uh, as I said, the uploading of new data proceeds much more quickly than my ability to analyze it. Um, the great majority of the data in ILDA, while searchable, still isn't analyzed. So while it's translated, the translations are often not quite as accurate as one might, might wish. So the data will be even more usable when it's analyzed. Uh, and I would have to emphasize, the process of analyzing all the data in ILDA will easily take decades to come for myself and other linguists working for the center. Um, I think it is possible that all of the manuscripts might be uploaded into ILDA in about eight years max. That's po I, think, I, I think if we are able to focus on it, that might actually be a finishing point. However, that's just the raw data basically being in a program. In terms of analyzing it, I, um, I don't think that's a project that will be completed in my lifetime. So just to let you know, this is basically a project that will go on for as long as people find it valuable. So because there's going to be, we'll, we could probably top out over at maybe 100,000 or 120,000 words in the database when we're done, is my guess. And so how much did I get to do it? Is this about right? And so now I'll hand things off to you. Um, so speaking of other linguists who work at the center, um, that's me. Um, my name is Dr. Hunter Thompson Lockwood, and um, I have had the chance to meet many of you before at various points along the way, either at Winter Gathering or um, at the National Breath of Life conferences or various other places along the way. Um, but for those of you who do not know me, um, as I mentioned, uh, my name already, I studied under Dr. Monica McCauley at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and we spent about, uh, who has spent, her, she has spent about 20 years plus uh, working with the Menominee uh, Nation of uh, Wisconsin. And um, 
I am a non-native linguist <laughs> who works for Miao Mia people. I like to, to frame things that way. Um, I grew up in a place that most people just call up north um, in the land that was ceded by Anishinaabe people in the Washington, uh, Treaty of Washington in 1836. Um, and I consider myself an Algonquianist really generally. I'm interested in uh, history, language, culture. All these things are impossible to separate for me um, and for many other people, I think, too. Um, although for those of you in this room, that's not super surprising news. There are many linguistic spaces where that is a controversial opinion. Um, and I've never heard an Anishinaab Emwin name for the place that I grew up, um, but we call it Houghton Lake in English. Um, I began working um, my career in 2008, working with uh, Ojibwe speakers, uh, speakers of Ojibwe in Ottawa. And I just have to take a moment to um, give some honor to these people who, um, after a few months of interacting with me, trusted me with their language enough that I was drafted by the man on the right, Howard Gimwan, um, to help teach his language. And I did not do a great job teaching it, but I did my best to give back where I was asked. Um, and the man in the middle, uh, Alphonse Peter Wanquat, both of them at the time worked for the University of Michigan, Alphonse still does. Um, and they're both Ottawa Ojibwe speakers from Manitoulin Island. Of course, naming a language as Ottawa or Ojibwe has its own set of controversies I will skip over for now. And um, since they're major reasons that I am here in the first place, um, I just wanted to take a moment for them. Um, and not pictured here is a, a Potawatomi elder who I owe an immense debt of gratitude to, who I will not name or show, um, because that is my understanding of the cultural teachings since he has recently left us. But I need to take a moment to honor him. Um, I used to badger all of these men with persistent questions about why does this word look this way? Why do you say it this way and not this way? Why do you put these things together? And um, oftentimes I would receive a response something like, it just depends on how a native speaker would have perceived it. It depends on how a fluent speaker would have looked at a thing or an event or a process and how it would have entered their minds. And that's why we put these things together the way we do. And of course, I had no idea what that meant for many years and I'm still trying to figure it out in some ways. But um, that's one of the things I sort of like to think about, right? So um, my sort of research, uh, broadly speaking, um, it's, it's really varied, but ultimately it comes down to a lot of things about words. I like to think about what a word is. Um, so it feels like a simple question, but it actually is an endless rabbit hole. Uh, are, are the words made of little pieces, or are those little pieces the words themselves, and the bigger words maybe just even allusions, or more like phrases? Um, where do things go in a word, like stress? How do I decide um, where to put the main stress in a word? Um, how are the, all the different and interrelated Algonquian languages similar? How are they different? Um, and all sorts of questions about variation. Right? What, what kind of variation do we see across space and time and place and even within speaker communities, a sort of variation that sometimes gets ignored in language reclamation projects. Um, it all can sound sort of simple, but as any good student of Miyamiyata Wangi knows, even simple words can be full of complexity and surprises. Um, so that's sort of a brief overview of what I do. But for me, it's not just enough to kind of idly think about words. Um, I'm more interested in this notion of reciprocity that uh, Dr. Leonard really talks about very aptly. Um, how can we as linguists um, contribute to your knowledge and your sorts of actions and activities and causes and um, politics and advance, uh, advance things for you? For me, it's, it's more about taking the knowledge that I have gained and then pumping it right back into Miami people and causes and programs and classes and however else it might be useful. I'm not really interested in linguistic theory only to the extent that it can help people. Um, I had an anecdote where once I told one of my professors of phonology, that's a certain way of studying sound, that I wanted to use linguistics to help people. And she looked at me and said, how do you do that? <laughs> I said, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know one day. Um, and that's just another thing about speakers sometimes being the furthest thing from linguists' minds, unfortunately. Um, so when thinking about how to put our sort of knowledge to good use, one of the things I think about a lot, um, and I'm thinking about this a lot too with Dr. Monica, Monica McCauley at University of Wisconsin, um, still is, is lexical expansion is what we call this now. You might hear other names like neologism and coinage, but it's all about 
how do we get more words? How do speakers of all human languages get more words over time and over change? Because humans are not static creatures, right? We don't just sit in a point in space. Um, we are constantly moving and changing and experiencing new things. Every new thing that we experience has an effect on us. Um, and this is just sort of one way that language and cultural revitalization and reclamation projects can kind of go hand in hand. Um, very frequently, new words have to be uh, invented or created or found, as in the case uh, of what we saw with the welcome example. And that is one of the things that our office deals with a lot is requests for vocabulary. Uh, when something must be innovated, we innovate it. But of course, we like to see what is there in the big data first. Um, and that's something that we're tuned to in a moment. Um, and what I'd like to point out here is that the kind of work we do doesn't just involve you know, haphazardly creating words willy-nilly. It involves taking a look at those hundreds of years of documentation and, and thinking about the speakers and why they made the decisions they did. Why did they put these pieces together in this way? Um, and it's sort of a conversation across time, as at least that's how I think about it. Um, when linguists consider uh, lexical expansion, we're really good at these first two considerations. Most linguists will think about grammatical considerations. So how is it that we get new forms in a language, right? How do we get new pieces to put together? How do new words come about at, at all? And semantic considerations. So how do we get new meanings, right? Do old meanings change and flex or, 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 or contract um, and become more specific? And we're not as good <laughs> at some other sets of things. I've just included one of those things that linguists are not very very good at here. And that's a set of like aesthetic considerations and a wide number of other cultural is the sort of euphemism we use for an incredible complex tapestry. Um, so we as linguists are not very good at saying what makes a beautiful miamia word, right? What makes a miamia word that you go, oh, that's a really, really neat word. Um, that's sort of, that's where the language belongs to you all, right? I can answer questions like, well, here's what a word like that could look like. Here's five different options that all make sense from some set of linguistic considerations. <laughs> but ultimately, those decisions aren't really mine to make. Um, and just to sort of revisit this point that you've now heard um, over and over again, the power of the ILDA platform is that it collects all of these centuries of words and, and speakers together in one place. That is not something that most projects that I've worked on can do. And I've worked on quite a few language revitalization projects, lexical documentation projects now. And for the most part, they take a very small slice of time um, and occasionally you get a few other slices of time. One of my good friends and colleagues, Robert Lewis, works with the Potawatomi community and he has um, a, about a 100 year slice of data and even for, for that's like really exciting. Um, we, don't, we have 5,000 words in the database that I helped work on for the Potawatomi. This is 78,000 entries, right? It's an incredible amount of data. And that direct connection, right, between Jared's office, the dictionary office, the community applications of this stuff and the research office, that's absolutely unique, right? A lot of the projects I've worked with, unfortunately, have um, kind of community applications as a hopeful eventual outcome, right? Well, we're going to do this stuff, and then hopefully one day it'll make back to the community, hopefully, right? But this is its direct connection all the time, and it's a fundamental part of our method. Um, so I'm going to transition a little bit then into morphology, into a little bit of grammar. Um, thinking first about simple words, and I put simple intentionally in scare quotes because that is a very loaded word. But we as grammarians refer to a word sometimes as simple if it does not appear to have any internal structure. Right? So if I take a, word, a look at a word like cow, no one in, the, in this room would probably say, well, the word cow comes from a meaningful piece, ka, and then there's the ow, and that no, that doesn't really make sense to us as speakers of English. But a word like cow hand has these two full words in it. Each one means something. And I want to note that the hand part of cow hand is meant to be a person. Right? We're not talking about a hand that a cow has and carries around in its mouth. We're, we're using hand as a stand-in for the relationship between a hand and a person. So it's a kind of a part for whole relationship, which we call metonymy, but it's not a word that you have to know. Um, and metonymy, as many people have pointed out to us uh, over the last 25 years, there's a wonderful paper by um, uh, Leanne Hinton uh, in the 1990s, that metonymy is a really, really, really common way that Native people over the last since time immemorial, have created words. And that's one of the things um, that I like to take a look at is how, how did speakers encode their relationships to objects um, forever? 
And thinking about now somewhat more complex terms, these are three different words for key, and we see two different Ojibwe words for key. And the first thing I want to say is then, it's not there's the Ojibwe way of saying key, right? There were and are many ways of saying these things depending on how a speaker would have perceived it, right? How it entered a speaker's mind. And so what is a key? If we think about a key, not in terms of a keyboard, but in terms of a thing that we use in everyday lives, right? Um, well, it's often metal, but it doesn't have to be. It's often small, but it doesn't have to be. But if it doesn't lock and unlock things, it's not a key, right? And so most of the time when I see a word for key across the Algonquian languages, it encodes an associated action for the key, right? A key is a thing for either locking or unlocking. And we see two different Ojibwe words for key that mean both. And the Miamia word I've found for key uh, indicates that it's a tool for locking. And so that's sort of neat. We see these similarities and differences across speakers, across time, across languages, across space. Um, speakers for thousands and thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial have had to create entirely new terms. And they often make use of these sorts of relationships between actions and objects and the way that they're used from a human perspective. Um, in this case, that association is not a body part, like a hand being a person, or sometimes you see a head standing for a person, but it's the thing that it is used for. And I, I note that I've included some things in quotes afterwards in parentheses, and what do those mean? Where do they come from, right? I call them literal translations, but where do I get these literal translations from? And the short answer is that we get them from comparing lots and lots and lots and lots of words, thousands and thousands of words across all sorts of spaces. And when you start to look at the little pieces of the words, then you start to notice patterns within that of why, why certain meanings are the way they are. And then you start to see some other structures in the language that are very important that speakers knew and know how to manipulate when they really can speak the language fluently. Ojibwe and Miami, Illinois both share this one form. So in the previous instance, we saw a new word coming about, new, new grammatical pieces coming together to create a meaning. In this case, we see two forms that are essentially the same. In Miamia, we have this word, tepanamani, which means I can reach it, I can handle it, I can put my arms around it, right? We've got this little verb piece, which I have glossed as act on it by hand. But but of course, if you went out and asked the speaker, hey, what does in mean? They couldn't tell you because it's not something that can just be used. But at the same time, they have full control over these pieces and how they're put together. In Ojibwe, however, that same form with the same pieces in the same grammatical context not only means I can reach for it and touch it and manipulate it with my hands, but it also means by metaphorical extension, I achieve it, right? I reach a goal. I accomplish it. And in other varieties of Ojibwe, it means something like I receive it. Right? So I'd like actually take ownership of something. Um, this is a way that the meanings change without the forms changing. Right? So we see, we see that sometimes too. Um, in this case, a sort of a metaphorical extension. Um, and that's by hand as opposed to other ways that we could imagine reaching something. For instance, there's a little verb final that means by foot or force of body, or there's another verb final that means something like using a tool to do something. So there's a lot of different kinds of combinations that we can make. And when we compare enough words across enough languages, we see the same kinds of relationships with the same kinds of pieces showing up over and over again, but also huge differences, really important differences, like we've seen over the last few examples. So one reason I bring this up is so that if I accidentally go into Ojibwe brain, you'll understand <laughs> that that's just where I've been for a while and I'm doing my best. Um, but by seeing these persistent kind of recurring relationships uh, with differences and a, sort of a life of their own in all the different languages, um, that, is, that is sort of where my brain lives a lot. That's sort of where my research sits. Uh, in the Potawatomi community I just was working with, um, we sometimes, and the, the speakers and the, and the teachers, sometimes refer to these pieces as verb guts. And this is a metaphor that made many of my Euro-American colleagues cringe because of the thought of the viscera being you know, described. But I think it's actually kind of an interesting metaphor, right? The, the guts are all crucially interrelated in these very principled ways. They crucially belong to the organism. And if you just take a piece of the gut out, it's not very useful to the organism it belonged to. And yet they can be described precisely. Um, and they're incredibly important as well. Um, although it does make some people wince a little bit to think about. 
Um, so that's all I'll go for today, but I am always happy to answer questions at, about any of these things and more. My goal for today and over the last um, while, I suppose, since I've been working here, has just been to immerse myself in as much of the material as possible. And as Dave and others have pointed out, there is an immense amount of material over a lot of time and a lot of space. And so hopefully after seeing a little bit more of my work as my our time and our interactions go on, you'll want to say, may I we tape it. And I hope I've given you something to think about with that last tape. So mission there.